Hello everyone, welcome to Cyber Hashira. In today's video, I'll be talking about public key cryptography standard. PKCS is a group of standards developed to describe a secure way to perform various crypto operations in a PKI. Now, these standards are numbered from 1 to 15 and I'll try to explain each of them in this video. So let's get into it. Public Key Cryptography Standard or PKCS is a group of standards describing how to securely exchange information in a public key infrastructure. Now these standards were made to be vendor neutral. For example, when you generate a PFX file using OpenSSL, you can open that PFX file on Windows or Linux or by using um, a key tool or cert util or any other application. Now this is possible because PFX follows PKCS 12 and PKCS 12 is one of the standard described in PKCS. The standards described in PKCS helps different vendors interoperate with each other. PKCS standards were published by RSA Security in 1990s. Initially, they developed these standards so they could promote the usage of RSA algorithms and their cryptographic techniques, but over time, they have become an industry standard. PKCS has a total of 15 standards. However, some of them have been withdrawn or merged into other PKCS standards. I'll be talking about them later in this video. All standards described in PKCS talks about a specific cryptographic operation. Some of those operations are based on RSA algorithm and uh, I'll start with PKCS1. PKCS1 describes RSA algorithm in detail and provides information about how to implement it in the best possible way. PKCS1 describes the mathematical properties of an RSA public key and a private key or you could just call them a key pair. Public keys are distributed publicly, whereas the private key is kept secret. Without diving into the math of RSA key, RSA keys are based on the difficulty of factorization. It is incredibly difficult to factorize a product of two large prime numbers. PKCS1 simply describes the mathematics behind RSA key pair. There are two encryption schemes described in PKCS1 for RSA algorithm. The first scheme is RSA ES PKCS1 where ES stands for encryption scheme. And the second scheme is RSA ES OAEP. OAEP stands for optimal asymmetric encryption padding. I'll talk about these two encryption schemes in detail in a future video. PKCS1 also describes two signature schemes. The first scheme is RSA SSA PKCS, where SSA stands for Signature Scheme with Appendix. The second scheme is RSA SSA PSS, where PSS stands for Probabilistic Signature Scheme. PKCS1 also recommends some security best practices. One of them is to not use two schemes together. They recommend using one scheme with a key pair. So let's say, for example, you have one RSA key pair. The recommendation says that you should be using only one type of signature or encryption scheme with that key pair. So for encryption, if you're using RSA PSS, then don't use RSA PKCS1 with that same key pair somewhere else. Similarly, if you're using RSA OAEP for signing some data, then don't use RSA PKCS1 with that same key pair somewhere else. Now this security measure ensures that the weakness of one scheme does not compromise the security of another scheme. For example, if you are using RSA PKCS1 and RSA PSS for encryption, then there is a risk that an attacker may be able to exploit the weakness of RSA PKCS1 scheme to compromise the security of RSA PSS scheme. Similarly, an attacker may be able to exploit the weakness of PKCS1 to compromise the security of RSA OAEP. Therefore, as a best practice, you should not use two schemes with a key pair. The next PKCS standard I'm going to talk about is PKCS3. PKCS3 talks about Diffie-Hellman key agreement. 
Diffie-Hellman protocol is useful when a secret key is required to be exchanged between two parties when they are communicating using an insecure channel. Now, both parties can agree on or exchange a secret key, which they can later use to encrypt their communication. PKZS5 talks about cryptography based on a password. First important point in PKCS5 is salting and iteration. There was a time when a username and password used to be stored as a plain text in a database. Developers quickly realized that it wasn't a good idea to store clear passwords. So they started storing uh, the hash of a password. Now the hashing algorithm used to produce these hashes could be MD5, SHA1 or SHA256 or something else. However, Hashes of a weak password could be easily cracked using brute force or dictionary attack. To prevent this from happening, it is recommended to use SALT. A SALT is some random data which is prepended or appended to a password. A SALTed password produces a different hash which makes brute force or dictionary attack more difficult. The next point in PKCS5 is Key Derivation Function or KDF. KDF is used to derive a key from a base data and PKCS5 tells us how to derive a secret key from a password. PKCS5 describes two KDF techniques. They are PBKDF1 and PBKDF2. PBKDF stands for Password Based Key Derivation Function. PBKDF1 is an old technique which uses MD2, MD5 and SHA1 hashing algorithm to derive a key. PBKDF1 should not be used because it uses an insecure algorithm. However, if you want, you can still use it to provide some backward compatibility to older application. PBKDF2 is a newer technique which uses pseudo-random function or PRF in short for key derivation. PKCS5 describes PBE or Password Based Encryption Scheme. In this scheme, the password is used to derive a secret key and, and then that secret key is used for encryption. There are two types of encryption schemes described in PKCS5, PBE-S1 and PBE-S2. The only difference between these two are the key derivation function which is being used to derive a key. PBE-S1 uses PBKDF1 and PBE-S2 uses PBKDF2. PKCS5 also describes message authentication scheme. As you might already know, MAC or message authentication code requires a secret key. In PKCS5, the secret key for calculating MAC is derived using password-based key derivation format too. The next standard is PKCS7. It is also known as CMS or cryptographic message syntax. This standard talks about storing signed or encrypted data. The signed or encrypted data is sandwiched between begin PKCS7 and end PKCS7 header. PKCS7 is also useful for storing an entire certificate chain in a bundle. In Windows, P7B files can be used to easily import a signed certificate along with an issuing CA and a root CA certificate. PKCS8 describes the syntax to store a private key. It also describes how to encrypt a private key using password-based encryption schemes described in PKCS5. PKCS8 formatted private keys are sandwiched between begin private key and end private key. Similarly, an encrypted PKCS8 formatted private keys are sandwiched between begin encrypted private key and end encrypted private key. PKCS10 describes the standard for certificate request a certificate signing request is a document which is required to be submitted to a certificate authority to get a signed certificate. A PKCS10 formatted certificate request includes information related to the subject such as the common name, the country, the location, the email. It also includes public key belonging to that subject along with a digital signature of that request. PKCS11 describes a platform-independent API for devices such as smart cards and hardware security modules. This API is also known as CryptoKey, which is a short form for cryptographic token interface. PKCS11 API describes precisely how to use various uh, algorithms and mechanisms and various other uh, cryptographic operations. 
Now, PKC11 is a vast topic which can't be explained easily in a single slide or um, in a single video. I will be making some videos on PKC11 very soon where I will teach you everything you need to know about PKC11 and how to use it. PKC12 describes the syntax to transport information such as private keys, secret keys and digital certificates bundled in a single file. PKC12 describes the archiving format for storing cryptographic objects. These objects are stored securely in an encrypted form using encryption algorithms such as triple DES and AES. PKC12 uses something called safe bags to hold cryptographic objects. Each safe bag holds one cryptographic object. A PFX file may contain multiple safe bags holding different types of cryptographic objects such as uh, digital certificates or private keys or maybe a secret key. I'm sure some of you must have come across files with PFX extension. There are many operating systems and browsers that allow sensitive information such as private keys to be imported or exported. Most of them use PFX format for this purpose. The key derivation function and encryption schemes used in PKCS12 are from PKCS5. And these are some other remaining standards in PKCS. PKCS2 has been merged into PKCS1. It describes RSA encryption. PKCS4 has been merged into PKCS1. This standard used to describe the syntax for an RSA key. PKCS6 is considered obsolete. It used to talk about extensions of a certificate. These extensions are now present in version 3 of X509 certificate. I have made a video which describes these extensions in details. Please check out the video I made on digital certificates on this channel. PKCS9 is still active. Details about PKCS9 is described in RFC 2985. PKCS9 describes the attributes which are used in PKCS7, PKCS8 and PKCS10. PKCS13 has been abandoned. It was supposed to describe elliptic curve cryptography. PKCS14 is also abandoned. It was supposed to describe the pseudo-random number generation. And finally, PKCS15 which is still active. This standard describes cryptographic token information format. And that brings us to the end. This is all I have for you today. I made this video to give you a quick overview on various PKCS standards. Some of my upcoming tutorials will be based on standards I talked about in this video. So I hope you learned something new. Please hit that like button if you like my content. And if you're new here, please support me by subscribing to my channel. I'll hopefully talk to you soon in my next video. Take care.